see some of the Burkhalter men walking in. I'm Alan Kramer, I'm one of the stewards here, and uh, we want to thank you all for being here in person or, or online, and um, first thing I want you to do, take out a card, register, but on the back, that's the most important part, because we would like to pray for you. So fill out any prayer request you have, a prayer request of praise, a prayer request of honor, a prayer request of need or thanksgiving, whatever it is, we know that, that everyone has their their own individual needs, and, and we would like to pray for you. Um, one other thing I'd like to, it's July 4th, and, and the 4th of July means a lot to, of different things to different people, but one thing it means to me is freedom to worship. We just sang a song about being here to worship, so let's remember the fact that that, that is one of the things that, that is important about the 4th of July, and let's uh, continue to worship God. And stand up together as we continue in worship this morning.
Good morning, church. Can you hear me? Great. I love 4th of July. Uh, it's a great time to spend with your family. Emma loves it because she gets to go to her aunt's house and play in the big giant swimming pool. But uh, for me, uh, I love it because coming to this country was the best thing that I ever did. It brought me so much joy. Uh, it brought me Alf. It brought me Emma. It brought me this church, and most importantly, um, I found God. So uh, as we thank our, our God for our freedom and our founding fathers, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our freedom on this special day. We affirm you as the source of all freedom, and it is bright with the memory of those who declared that life and liberty are your gift to every human being. Please continue to guide us in the good work that started long ago and move forward with our strong will for solidarity. This is the only way we can truly honor you. Give us the grace and the wisdom to understand the ways of others to offer friendship, and to find the common good in all of us. The good you have gifted us, our creator. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. When peace like a
the table of the Lord this morning and we look into the scriptures in which I'm going to read from Matthew in just a minute, but I am convicted that at the very first table of the Lord, there was betrayal all around. There was betrayal at the table by Judas and still Jesus knew his heart and he chose him. When Judas left, Jesus calls the disciples his friends and says, now I call you friends because I'm telling you what I have done. But I was surprised when I read further into the scripture that in the garden at Jesus' betrayal, Jesus calls Judas friend again and says, friend, will you betray me with a kiss? So as we come to this table, what I hope we understand is that none of us come with any righteousness of our own. And that's okay, because at this table, where we sit down with the Lord, he calls you friend. And I would like you to take a moment to prepare your heart to sit down with your friend as I read to you some scripture from that time, and then we will take the Lord's Supper together. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go on just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, yes, it is you. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. If you would take the bread from your packet and eat this. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Blessed be the reading of the word. Would you please pray with me together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Part of the way we show our gratitude is that we give from what we have, our time, resources, and our gift of money. As you are welcome at home to give online or mail a check, uh, you can drop it in the, in the back as you leave. May the good Lord bless you so that you may be a blessing to others. And if you would please stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated.
so much, Jared and Harrison and Helen. Good morning, 1548 Heights, members and friends on in person and online. So good to see you this morning. See many of you with your red, white, and blue colors. Amen. I, I, try, I did that a little bit, but everybody's just commenting on the lobsters on my shirt. So uh, the message was supposed to be red, white, and blue, but it, it, the message instead became lobsters. <laughs> who, who knows? Anyway, it's really good to see you on this holiday weekend. I want to affirm what people have said about the specialness of living in the United States, the freedom to worship, and G's comments about coming here uh, many years ago. It's, it's, it's a blessing. We are in the second week of a series called Proclaim, looking at seven messages that were preached as we read them in the book of Acts, the story of the early church. And the stated purpose of this series was to sort of remind us and return us to the essential gospel message because it's easy to sort of devolve into Christian self-improvement. And I acknowledge that I sort of felt like I do that sometimes in my preaching. And so we began last week by looking at the Apostle Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and we called that the the gospel versus Christian self-improvement. And today we're going to look at another sermon by the Apostle Peter. It's just a little farther along in the story. And we're going to look at it in terms of the gospel versus safety. The gospel versus safety. Now when I talk about the gospel, I'll talk about it all the time. What do I mean? I mean essentially the, the, the life and atoning death and victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ and the life-saving and life-changing impact of that as it reverberates outward in our hearts and outward into our lives, but always with that center, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So that the Apostle Paul at one point will say, I, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, meaning I, 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 I want to always know that I am connecting to this essential core of what gives us salvation and life in Christ. So let me give a little prelude to where we're going to focus today. So after Peter's sermon on Pentecost, uh, many, many people are baptized and a, sort, a Christian community sort of forms and we're told that uh, they cooperate and they meet together to pray and they're very close-knit. And I want to point out that this early Christian community was still connected to the temple, still connected to the Jewish community. It wasn't separate yet. Uh, maybe the best ex uh, example I could use was in, in the 70s. Um, you know, certain charismatic wings broke out 
in established denominations, and, and they didn't separate, but, the, oh, those people are doing those strange things, you know. So we're going to read today that Peter and John go up to the temple at the hour of prayer. That's what they did. They were still part of the temple community, the Jewish community. So they go up to the temple, and there's a man who has been crippled since birth, and his friends bring him, and they put him at the, at the entrance so he can beg for alms. Almsgiving is a very important part of Jewish faith and life. And P- Peter sees him, and the man sees Peter, and they, they meet their eyes, and Peter says, I do not have silver or gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And the man stands up and walks. And it's such a sweet little description. He follows Peter and John walking and leaping and praising God uh, into the temple area. And so they go over to this area called Solomon's Portico, the porch area. And a whole crowd follows them because they've seen this crippled man and now he's walking. And Peter essentially preaches another Pentecost type message. That why do you marvel at what you see in the name of Jesus Christ? This man has gotten up and walked, and he talks about who Jesus is and how the scriptures foretold the Messiah, and God has raised him up. You crucified him. And then we pick up the story at chapter 4, verse 1. Here's a picture of the temple, by the way, and right back there. The beautiful gate is where Peter and John meet the, the crippled beggar, and then they walk over to the Solomon's portico, the porch. So pretty big... Uh, Pretty big temple there, isn't it? Reminds us a little bit of 1548 Heights, doesn't it? All that stone. Anyway. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do today. You know how when you're reading your Bible, there will be little subheadings above certain passages to give you an idea of kind of what that passage is about? The Bible. So the Bible is a book, and you know, and so, <laughs> you know, as when you read the Bible, there's usually a little subheading. So we're going to go through this passage, and I'm going to suggest four special subheadings to orient around this message today. So we'll read part of the passage, and I'll say, "Here's the subheading I suggest," and those are going to essentially be our four points today. The old saying is, how many points should a sermon have? At least one, right? Well, we're going to have four. So read with me, chapter 4, verse 1 through 4 on the screen. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, this is when they're preaching, right? The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there's the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. Here's the subheading. You can arrest people, but not the gospel. You can arrest people, but not the gospel. So Peter and John are arrested, and but 5,000 believe. They believe because Peter and John were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I love this passage because we're told that these religious authorities were much annoyed by Peter and John. Luke uses this uh, expression. It's only used one other time in the Bible, also in Luke, in chapter 16, where Paul is being followed around by a girl with a spirit of divination, and she's actually giving praise and honor to God and Jesus, but Paul just gets annoyed with her, all right? It's like you're swatting a little gnat away. And so they, they, they're just annoyed with Peter and John. They're not taking them all that seriously yet, but, you know, we don't, we don't want to have time to deal with this stuff. And so they arrest them. The temple had a little jail. You had temple guards and everything. It was like its own little sort of organization. And they're annoyed. And I couldn't help but thinking of that great classic deep movie, Princess Bride. Remember where uh, King Humperdinck or Buttermilk or whatever his name was, you know, just he says, if you don't do this, I shall be very put out. <laughs> So they they are put out with James and John. 
but 5,000 people hear and believe. (laughs) You can arrest people, but you can't arrest the gospel. Willie James Jennings, uh, uh, a theologian who is sort of a conversation partner with us in this series, puts it this way, speaking holy words has serious consequences. These are not words that simply speak of God. There is nothing inherently serious, holy, or dangerous in God talk. The holy words that bring consequences are words tied to the concrete, liberating actions of God for broken people. Such holy words bring the speakers into direct confrontation with those in power. Jesus not only spoke such words, but he was such a word. Friends, don't don't be fooled. When you you talk about God, you know, oh God, it's fine. You know, it's better than not talking about about God maybe. But it's it's just, it, it doesn't really have any power or focus. But when you talk about Jesus Christ liberating people, from their brokenness and sin, that has power. Those are holy words. And so Peter and John do that. Friends, the gospel is like loose electricity, is like rushing stream, and it cannot be contained. You can arrest people, but you cannot arrest the gospel. Let's continue in the story, verse 5 through 7. The next day, so they're in jail, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? So here's our subheading. The gospel thrives as an underdog. The gospel thrives as an underdog. Luke depicts this scene. It's, it's, it's just masterful. You have all these religious authorities. I mean, the highest of the highest. And they are immaculately dressed in Brooks Brothers. Uh, and they've got the wingtips and cufflinks and freshly manicured nails and... Those, you know, all those abbreviations behind your name, you know, PhD, this or that, MSW, you know, just, uh, and, and they, they're so credentialed. They're so credentialed. <laughs> and, and they make Peter and John stand in their midst while they're seated. Let's see what these yokels have to say for themselves. And then you have Peter and John, and I mean, look, they're, they're, they're fishermen, right? They, you know, they probably smell a little bit. And even though they've been following Jesus for a while, if, if the temperature gets high enough in the room, you can smell the fish on them because they were fishermen. And they got a couple of missing teeth. And, and they don't talk in very good grammar. And so these religious authorities, the grand poobahs, make them stand and essentially say, now, who gave you permission to do what you just did? To, to heal this crippled man and then to p- preach about the resurrection and Jesus and all this stuff. But, but what power or what authority do you do this? And we're looking at this and thinking, oh my goodness, uh, gosh, what a mismatch. And this is right where the gospel loves to be. This is right where the gospel loves to be to be because the gospel thrives as an underdog. There's a scene from a movie that was 35 years ago uh, when Randy Borkhalter was 40. But anyway, uh, that was for Randy because Randy's got his two brothers here, Robbie and Ronnie, and and it's like the three amigos, you know, the three musketeers or maybe the three stooges. I don't know, but anyway. But... uh, where was I? I don't know. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> so, so, so Luke's got him standing there, and and oh, Silverado, yes, 1985. Uh, it was a western, one of those classic westerns. And Danny Glover, the actor, plays one of the good guys, and he walks into this saloon and he says, "I'll I'll take a drink." 
and the bartender, you could tell, didn't want to serve him, but she serves him, and then the manager walks out and spots this black man and says, I'm sorry, you're not welcome here. And uh, three local tough guys stand up to back up the manager, and, and Glover turns to face them, and over here, Kevin Klein and Scott Glenn, they don't know Glover, but they're looking at him. He's a big dude, and he looks pretty tough. But, but Glenn goes, three against one, I, is this a fair fight? And Kevin Klein says, which way do you mean? <laughs> you, uh, you find it as funny as I did at the time. But So we're looking at the religious authorities of the grand poobahs, and, and little Peter and John, and we're saying, isn't this a mismatch? And the gospel is saying, which way do you mean? Which way do you mean? This is right where God works. Do you know where the gospel is outmatched? When the gospel is wearing the, the Brooks Brothers and the wing tips and the manicured nails and the nice gold watch and has all the degrees and credentials and thinks it's so, so prestigious. That's where the gospel just loses its power. Whenever it's in the places of power of the world. And so when Peter and John are sitting here, sitting here right before the panel, oh, this is perfect placement. This is perfect placement because the gospel thrives as an underdog. We're told that uh, uh, in verse 13, they say these are uneducated and ordinary men. Where do they get this power they've just spoken to us with? And, and the word for ordinary is uh, idiotes, from which we get idiot. It doesn't mean what, the way we use it. It means they were untrained. They were unschooled. How did they, they're not experts, and yet they speak and preach the gospel with power. Friends, the David versus Goliath scenario plays itself out all the time in the Christian life where Christians are underdogs. The gospel is an underdog. The work of the church or the work of any of us is an underdog. And God is able to use that and work with great power, much more so when we're the favorite. Okay? You think of our story here at 1548 Heights. It is such a common story that a hundred year old church, the demographics have changed in the area. And it's shrunk down to a few people, and they can't sustain it. And so they sell it to another church that comes in from a suburb or something and plants a satellite and re replants and revives. That's a very common story. You know what is a very uncommon story? Is when the very people who are there replant and revive. And that's what we've been doing for the last five years. And we've been underdogs. And that's right where we need to be because God works in special ways when the gospel is an underdog. And we see that here. Let's continue verse 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, so he's responding to them, and said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Good thing Peter was so meek in the face of these authorities, right? Friends, here's the subheading. The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. You know, Peter, uh, gosh... He missed his opportunity. He could have started building a great brand here. You know, mentioning on social media, yeah, healed a crippled, crippled beggar the other day. If you'd like me to help your church do that, you know, start, uh, start getting that little personal development thing going. But instead, Peter says, let's, let's make no mistake about how this happened. It happened because of Jesus Christ. 
The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. Let me tell you something about the establishment. The establishment loves control and order and predictability and certainty. And this is also true of religious establishments. The 21st, 20th century theologian Karl Barth once said, and I want you to listen to this, religion is often man's last stand against God. Religion is often last, man's last stand against God. We, we put up the wall of religion so God won't break in too much and change the things we hold most dear. And that's what's happening here. Peter is, is announcing changes, and the religious establishment doesn't like it. This is the religious establishment, by the way. It's not the government. It's not the government. It's the religious authorities. Churches get used to the way we always do things, and if the spirit breaks in, that's inconvenient. That's inconvenient. You know what that's like. You do. Because there are times when the Spirit of God is trying to urge you to do something different, to take a chance. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you go, mm, that's not the way I always do things. That's not the way I always do things. Would you please work in the ways that I authorize you to, God? The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. Let it be known to all of you and to the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It reminds us what John the Baptist says. Remember, he must increase and I must decrease. It reminds us what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. Listen to this. He says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or power. All things have been created through him and for him. Listen. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place or preeminence in everything. Friends, too many Christians say, he must help me increase. That is Jesus' role, to help me increase. And John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. God isn't trying to help us build our brand. Now, it's fine if we're doing that vocationally or commercially. That's all fine. But that's not God's purpose in us. It is to build Jesus' brand. Here's the irony. Here's the paradox of the gospel. When Jesus increases in your life, you open yourself up to God to work in ways that engage your deepest hopes. Let me say that again. When Jesus increases in your life, you open yourself up to God for God to work in ways that engage your deepest hopes. May I say that a third time? When Jesus increases in your life, when you give Jesus more preeminence instead of less, you open yourself up to God to work in ways that engage your deepest hopes because that is what you are created for. Created in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. To do good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the last part. Last pa part. Verse 13 and 14. Now, they, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, there's our word idiotes, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. They just they had nothing else to say. They were just kind of speechless. What in the world should we do with these guys? Well, I got no, no ideas now. Here's our subheading. The gospel and safety seldom work together. The gospel and safety seldom work together. Safety's in the building. Safety's important. I mean, look, you shouldn't drive without a seatbelt. 
You shouldn't run across the freeway. You know, wear a mask during the pandemic, fine. But it's kind of a different department. The gospel and safety don't seem to come together and work very much. Uh, and, and what we see is they notice Peter's boldness. They notice Peter's boldness. Listen to what Mark, uh, Willie Jan- Jennings says about that. He says, Peter speaks boldly, but this boldness is not the result of character, refinement, or moral formation. Peter has not become the great man who stares down his enemies with epic courage, the kind that creates an odyssey or heroic tale. Indeed, there is no such thing as individual boldness for the followers of Jesus. Of course, each disciple can and must be bold. Listen. But their boldness is always a together boldness, a boldness born of intimacy. The modern live individualism is most powerful when we imagine that boldness comes from within. It does not. It comes from without from the Spirit of God. This whole thing reminds us of what Jesus says in Mark chapter 13, verse 11. Read it with me. He says, When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Friends, the gospel and safety seldom work together. During the pandemic, there was a legitimate concern about doing things safely. And I make no, I have no issue with that. But there was an expression that came out of that. It didn't originate in that. But we heard it over and over. Over and over. And it became almost like a shibboleth. That's a biblical expression, meaning you, you say the words and you're, you're accepted. I'm going to put it on the screen for you and see if you can finish it for me. Out of an abundance of... Caution. (laughs) Out of an abundance of caution, we've decided to close this or that or not do this or that. I mean, we heard it over and over. Fine for the pandemic. Here's my point. That can become almost like a personal philosophy, almost like a worldview, almost like a religious practice. Out of an abundance of caution, we're not going to take any risks. One one commentator says, safetyism, placing safety above all else, has almost become like a new religion. Friends, if, if Jesus had said, out of an abundance of caution, he probably wouldn't have ever associated with women or empowered them. He wouldn't have touched lepers, because that was forbidden by the law. He wouldn't have sent out disciples two by two with no supplies because, you know, they might run out. He wouldn't have transformed the Sabbath. He wouldn't have given the Great Commission. What if Jesus had lived with the mindset of out of an abundance of caution? In John chapter 10, verse 10, many of us know this verse. Jesus says, the thief comes to kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. Do you think he means so we can have an abundance of caution? I wonder if Jesus means something more like this. Out of an abundance of faith and hope and love, out of an abundance of joy, out of an abundance of passion and purpose and courage, out of an abundance of compassion, mercy, and justice. Wow. And Christians so often live out of an abundance of caution. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 through 7, Paul says this to Timothy, his young protege. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or caution, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Let me ask you a personal question, friends. Have you perhaps unknowingly adopted this mindset to approach your life and your life with Christ with an abundance of caution, with an abundance of caution. You know, I thought about inviting that friend or coworker to church, but out of an abundance of caution, in case they pulled out a gun and shot me in the face, you know, I mean, what are we doing? 
What are we doing here? The gospel and safety seldom work together. The minute you say, my safety is above all else, the gospel, you look around and it's kind of left. It's kind of left. Because the gospel needs faith and boldness to respond to it, to carry it. Listen, I've been part of the local church for 30 years. I mean, you was, uh, local churches, some, some of them ought to have this on the wall. You know, <laughs> do this in remembrance of me and on the other, out of an abundance of caution. You know, we just oh, hand wringing. Oh, my goodness. What is what is Sister Louise going to say? She could be offended. Oh, my goodness. I'm getting a little animated here. The gospel and safety seldom work together. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John. As one person says it, you can live a full life or you can live a safe life. You can't live both. The Christian version of that is, you can be filled with the Spirit of Christ and live abundantly or you can put safety first, but you can't do both. In some ways, I said the gospel can't be arrested. People can't. In some ways, we arrest ourselves. We arrest ourselves by our low expectations and by our concern with comfort and safety. Apropos of this day, what if 246 years ago, the Continental Congress had said, out of an abundance of caution, we're not going to issue the de Declaration of Independence. We're going to plead one more time with King George that he would maybe... Help us exercise our rights and not be so tyrannical to us and not rob us with excessive taxation, all these things, out of an abundance of caution. What if, what if we declare independence and it goes bad? What, what, if, what if that had happened? Life as we know it would be different. And so in conclusion, friends, you can arrest people, but you can't arrest the gospel. The gospel thrives as an underdog. The gospel keeps Jesus preeminent. And the gospel and sa safety seldom work together. Here's my question for you. Will you keep Jesus preeminent? Or you, will you make him preeminent? Will you stop worrying so much about your own safety and comfort so the gospel can work in you? Will you accept that as an underdog... You're in a position for God to work in ways he would never work if you were the favorite. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray now, and I want you to pray. We're going to pray sort of Paul's prayer for Timothy to remind us to rekindle the gift of God that is in with it, within us through our baptism into Christ. Because God did not give us a spirit of timidity but one of power and love and self-discipline. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the life-changing, life-saving saving gospel of Jesus, Lord. Forgive us our fears. Forgive us our caution. Forgive us our concern with ourself being preeminent and being safe. Lord, we want you to unleash the gospel and the power of the gospel through us to others, to bless others. Lord, would you help each of us, each of us, think boldly for how you can work in our life and how we can be of use to you in your kingdom and how we can know the deepest longings you are bringing to fruition in our life because Jesus is preeminent. In his powerful name we pray, amen. Let's sing Salvation Belongs to Our God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power.
Thank you, Jared, Helen, and Harrison. Isn't it great to see Helen and Harrison back today? So credentialed now with uh, two degrees. I went a little long today, didn't I? Some of you were getting a little persnickety, you know. Uh, I, I do that every time July 4th falls on a Sunday. Friends, may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you today. God bless you. So this purchased by His blood.